Yo, what is up guys, Grim here, and in today's video, in usual fashion, I'm going to give you guys a full breakdown of everything me and my stream have discovered in day one of Siege of the Atlas, and there is a lot to talk about. But first, if you're not already, make sure to sub to the channel if you want a ton more Atlas content, as well as like the video if you enjoy this one specifically. But without further ado, let's get into it. So of course, I did League Start Corrupting Fever, and I was quite concerned that it might be a bit of a risk. However, that risk paid off. It's been an absolute blast, and I've had no issues after completing the story, uh, and overall, it's been a complete breeze. I even was able to take down both of the new endgame bosses, and their mini bosses on day one by myself without any assistance in worse gear that I'm showing here. So let's get into the Atlas. So of course, when you're going through the campaign, the first thing that you're gonna be encountering is the new act two. Nothing to worry about though. The buffs really aren't that hard. I didn't even notice it and Oak actually seemed easier than usual. That's pretty much it for the story. Once you complete the story, you're gonna be asked to come over to the Karui Shores. Now, this is the first thing that you're gonna notice. It's pretty hard to figure out where to damn go in the Karui Shores, but I'll give you guys a quick tip. So essentially you're gonna spawn over here with Helena. All you're gonna come down here is come down all the way around here, left, up, and then come up through the tunnel. So you don't need to worry about going over here. So that's the kind of tip number one. Then of course, as usual, you get your map, you're asked to do it, and then you basically have your map device. After that, it's basically on to completing maps, but it's a little bit different than usual. So you're no longer required to pursue the conquerors. Instead, all you need to do is just roll your way through map completion, doing the bonus objectives as you see fit. And it's fairly simple. The map completions come easy uh, and you know obviously you start out in tier one maps and you know everything is interconnected and you can just work your way up the tiers without any sort of hindrance at all. If you didn't want to you could literally completely ignore the Eldar um, sorry, not the Eldar, the Eldritch uh, bosses, you could ignore the Maven, and, you know, honestly, you wouldn't be any worse for wear. You'd just lose the opportunity to get a bit of extra juice, as well as, you know, be able to, you know, kind of get some extra Atlas points. Uh, but overall, you're not actually going to be penalized at all. If all you want to do is map and not worry about any of the bossing stuff, you actually don't even have to worry, which is fantastic. So you're going to cruise your way through white maps, into yellows uh, and around about the yellow point uh, you're going to start encountering um, the envoy now the envoy is going to tell you to you know have a chat to maven uh, and you'll be able to start to maven witnessing maps kind of like you're used to but the only purpose for witnessing maps is actually going to be to obviously gain access to the crucible fights like you used to uh, I'll note with significantly nerfed loot uh, and that's just going to give you some extra atlas points uh, to kind of play around with on the Atlas passive tree, which we'll talk about here in a second here. Uh, if you want to access the passive tree, uh, I believe it is control G. Yeah, control G uh, for me or control whatever your Atlas key is. You can also access it using the Atlas skills and maybe you can even see your key bind up here on the top left. Uh, so that's pretty damn handy. But overall, you're going to pick up some Atlas points. Uh, and then as you start getting deeper into yellows, um, the Envoy will now start to notify you that there are other Eldritch Horrors that could be pursued. And the Maven's not all that you have to worry about. Now, in order to get access to the two buttons that you see here on the left and the right, you're going to need to encounter the Envoy just naturally through your mapping experience just a few times. Uh, and you'll see him pop up. He'll have his massive slab of text as usual. Uh, and then eventually he's going to have the classic quest giver exclamation mark as well as a big massive cosmetic like thing that is next to uh, and what that's going to be either for the eater of worlds uh, or for the searing exarch you're probably going to get either one of them uh, and they spawn around yellow maps after you've had the envoy spawn a few times so when you see the exclamation mark on your mini map make sure to talk to the envoy and after doing so and giving you some more text and lore he's going to basically just drop a quest item like usual i believe it's called a flesh compass uh and for the eater of worlds as well as something i think something else lantern for the exarch uh, and then once you have those um you can use them in a similar fashion to the maven's beacon from the last expansion uh, and you can gain access to these two buttons here on your atlas uh, which is essentially going to allow you to apply a um you know, a charge of the Eater of Wells or the Exarch to your Atlas. That's it. No other catches. You don't have to do any other sort of mission 
skins. There's no sort of cycles really. Uh, all that is is you have access to these and you can play with them whenever you want. Now, putting these on your map device uh, and activating them will allow you to gain access to the chosen influence type, but it's only in a very limited capacity. You can only run, you know, probably about three or four of these yellow maps uh, with the Exarch or Eda respectively before they lose interest in your maps uh, and migrate to higher tiers. They'll continue to move up the tiers of maps until the only maps they're interested in are T16 maps. Uh, in which after you, you know, kind of move your way through around the, about the T14 mark, uh, you're going to be asked uh, to kind of battle it out with the mini bosses, the Black Star, and I can't remember the other one. I think it's Infinite Hunger. Uh, and in order to actually fight them, uh, all you have to do is complete the map uh, in which, uh, you know, it's been discovered that they have their invitation in. Uh, you just do that by killing the boss and they just drop a quest version of their invitation. Uh, you obviously take that to the map device. Uh, you you activate it and then boom, you're in. Uh, and you know, the difficulty of these bosses, I would place probably uh, at least for the Eater of Worlds one uh, at about a, um, you know, probably at a bestiary boss level, uh, you know, maybe like a, a sack of wall or a Phenomus. They're quite easy. You should be able to do them on your mapping build. They're about equal to uh, maybe a yellow or early red conqueror probably about it's fairly easy i would expect that you should be able to do it now i'm not, not going to spoil the fights for you uh because you know they're not too high level and they're very visually appealing and there's a, you know a few ex surprises in there uh and the main thing i want to point out here they're not very punishing um so the hardest one is definitely probably out of the entire four um or new bosses is probably the black star uh there's definitely a lot going on in that fight but once you kind of figure it out it's kind of a little bit easy uh the tip i will give you there because it can be a little bit frustrating if you don't know what you're doing is that when you're fighting her and she's using her mechanics she's either going to be blue or red if you're if she's red, make sure you're on the red side. It's gonna be, you know, fairly obvious. Uh, and if she's blue, uh, make sure you're on the blue side. And that's gonna allow you to actually interact with their mechanics effectively. But overall, after you encounter these T14 bosses, you take them down, uh, you know, you're gonna have a pretty good time. But if you don't, like me, I had quite a few issues with the Black Star early on with my Corrupting Fever build, because I didn't really have that very good gear. Um, you, if you fail, uh, all you have to do is, um, you know, you, okay, you failed, you lost all your portals, no problem. All you need to do is another map of the required tier that you were just doing uh, with that influence again, and it's instantly gonna drop you another invitation straight away. Unlike the Conquerors, you gain instant access it's not punishing at all so you could literally fail it three times and then all you have to do is run three more t14s not a problem at all and it's really really easy to get back into the fight and that also is the case with the syrian exarch and the eater of worlds so you can kind of like really learn the mechanics fast really get back into it really fast and easy uh, and there's not going to be really any issues with you getting through these bosses you're not going to have to hire a carrier or anything like that unless your build really is having some trouble um, and overall it's gonna be fine Okay, so after doing those mini bosses, you can make your way up to T16s uh, and complete more maps. Uh, and then once you kind of do a bit more influence, I think it's about four or five more influence maps, um, you will obviously now drop a invitation to either the Searing Exarch or the Eater of Worlds respectively. Uh, and then you can ready and, you know, get engaged with those end game bosses. It's a similar affair. Uh, I'd probably put the difficulty level uh, on a red conqueror, a T14 conqueror. They're pretty easy. Uh, I think that the quest ones are definitely intended to be completed by you know any character. Um, so I would highly recommend going to these blind, and I'd also highly recommend going into them on any build. I think you should be able to complete them on pretty much every build I recommended on my starter list, uh, even corrupting fever. I had gear worse than this, and uh, it was no problem. I killed the eater of worlds after two attempts uh, and then I kill the Exarch on my first attempt uh, so it's definitely not a problem now these different uh, bosses are in fact going to drop their uniques they have a 100% chance to drop a unique uh, and this can be a pretty good opportunity to make a little bit of money um, so overall their drop pool in my opinion is a little bit undervalued and we'll get to that in a second here um, but I, I think the items are very very cheap indeed so the items that I got, I got the staff off of the Searing Exarch, which I've got listed for 25C, but no one wants. Um, <laughs> and then I also dropped uh, the boots off of the Eater of Welts. Now, they also do have the potential to drop their 
respective jewels, the Forbidden Flame and the Forbidden Flesh. And I can confirm after Elishar slaying his versions uh, that these are an individual drop separate from their unique. So it's exactly like Watcher's Eyes, you drop the unique and then there's a separate roll for the jewel. So that's useful information I think for most people. Okay, that's pretty much the progression out of the way. After you complete the Eater of Worlds and the Searing Exarch once, they move into their end game farmable state. Uh, you get some Atlas points to play with uh, and they go basically on lockdown until uh, you're able to really get some serious mapping done. And I mean serious. So after your first uh, encounter with them and the first defeat of them, uh, you actually have to do a further 28 T14 plus maps to gain access to them again. So that is a lot of time time uh, obviously that's certainly within reason you know when we compare it to conquerors you know that's about the same uh, but it is a fairly large hike uh, to get back to them meaning after you gain access to your first unique uh, or first opportunity at the jewel, it's going to be another 28 maps before you can get another access to them. Uh, so overall, this is probably going to create a scenario in which everyone has super easy access to them first. There's a big surge of the uniques. And then as people stop being able to get them for free so easily, uh, there won't be as many uniques flooding the market. So I think the unique price will stabilize as well as people starting to use the uniques and figuring out what they're good for. Um, so overall, pretty damn good. Now I mentioned Atlas skill points. Let's talk a little bit about that and map sustain as I keep forgetting which button to press here. Um, so overall, there was a lot of talk about, you know, should I get the Atlas passive nodes here, there, anywhere. Um, so overall, I decided to go safe and steady. Um, now, I did deviate from my pen just a little bit. Uh, and the first reason I did that is Kirak. So overall, Kirak wasn't as impactful or relevant as I thought he would be. Um, if you did take the Kirak nodes, there's definitely no issues. There's plenty of scouting reports on offer, and you can probably make quite a little bit of currency buying these and using them at your discretion to get stuff like free breach stones, blighted maps, and overall quite a lot of value. Um, but in terms of progressing your atlas, he's really not necessary. I think you could probably get away with just taking the one node I have here. That's gonna give you a few Kirak missions and essentially put you in a position where you never really have to buy maps. The best strategy probably is going to be to go for a full completion as you go. So go from the bottom up and don't really push too hard unless you've got some specific objective in mind where you need to be in reds. So you should probably just try and methodically complete all the maps you can and get all the Atlas passives you can and work your way from the bottom up. So do all your T1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s and 6s. And basically the way I did it is I completed all the maps I could gain access to and purchase off Kirak. Um, and then I basically would use my Kirak missions that I've accumulated after, you know, hanging out in that tier for a while to fill in the blanks. You can also use scouting reports, which you pick up uh, to really re-roll his inventory quite aggressively and i'll show you kind of what that looks like there is a item called the explorer scouting report which you should be dropping a pretty reasonable amount of i've used quite a few of mine and i already have quite a few more left over so these are called explorer scouting reports uh, you can just jump onto the map device here and the way that you use kirak is all you have to do is come on and take a look how many missions you have of white yellow or red respectively if you have some missions available click on Kirak here, and then you'll see that you have the different Kirak missions available. You can hover over and see what the mission is and also what the completion is. And also holding all will display if you've completed the map or not. Now, if you wanted to reroll his inventory, all you have to do is use an Explorer scouting report like a normal orb and it will reroll the inventory. Looks like I got a Guardian map. I'm probably gonna be doing that after I make this video as I need the completion. Uh, but overall, that's as easy as it is. I will re-roll them and you'll have a new inventory here to play with and you'll potentially get some maps that you need or you'll be guaranteed to get some maps you need due to the existence of the Explorer's scouting report. But as I've already completed all my maps, it's given me something I don't have yet, which is pretty useful. So that's Kirak and that's his missions. Uh, they're not super required, but they can be quite good, specifically in the end game right now. Uh, Guardian maps are a hot topic and Conquerors are even hotter with a Warlord's Exalted um, kind of ring going for about 50C just for the base. Uh, they're, you know, Hunter and uh, Warlord and all of the Conqueror base items are hot topics and you can access them somewhat deterministically through Kirak missions. So they're not awful nodes to have picked up, uh, but overall they're not required for your map progression. Okay, let's move on to the map nodes, which I've recommended as well as the other supplementary nodes. So I decided to take these effective immediately and get through the story as far as uh, the Atlas as fast as possible. And these have effectively allowed me to do that quite easily. Now, the problem here is I don't know anyone who didn't take the map 
app nodes. So I can't really speak to the experience that you'd have without them. But with them, as I've, as you can probably see, I was able to complete the Atlas without really needing to, uh, you know, ask for any help. I think I traded maps with a few people in my chat uh, to kind of get some of the uh, yellow completions done to fill in some of the maps. But outside of that, I pretty much SSF'd a full Atlas uh, and it was absolutely no issues. And I did it in under 24 hours, including both of the boss kills. Uh, so it's very, very effective if you take these map nodes uh, and overall it's going to be very very easy so do you need them uh, I actually do not know if you do need them. Uh, however, I think that a lot of them do have quite a nice few benefits and you're certainly going to want to be taking at least Shaping the Seas if you have any intention of running your favorite maps. I think it's still better to be safe than sorry, uh, but if you wanted to kind of go on some crazy, you know, um, like way over their kind of strategy i think it's a little bit safer than it was before the league uh and map drops do seem to be reasonably plentiful uh if you're not interested in favoriting and infinitely sustaining any one map um but overall yeah not too bad uh having said that though i did have a few players who were playing from standard come in and tell me that it's actually not really possible to sustain t16 maps uh, you know, in the end game with a mild amount of juice without these nodes. So if you're planning on trying to sustain high tier red maps, you may have some issues without these nodes, but that's not something I've experienced myself. That is completely anecdotal on their part. Uh, so I'd probably still recommend going for these nodes uh, if you plan on doing any end game farming. But if you're just trying to progress through whites and yellows, maybe you can kind of put it off and get some more interesting stuff in the meantime. Okay, so in addition to that, I also made a beeline for Harbinger, Strongbox, and Shrine. Now, these are the nodes which I absolutely fully can recommend, specifically Essence as well. These nodes are completely ridiculous, uh, and overall, they've made me very, very rich, and also have helped my, you know, kind of experience quite a lot. So, the first one I want to talk about here is Strongbox. So, Strongbox is some of the most ridiculous stuff I've ever seen, uh, specifically paired with the Operative node here. So, Operative, uh, the Operative Strongbox, drops about one to two Scarabs base. They can be rusted, polished, or gilded, which with the opportunity to roll wings if you roll the strong marks correctly. So one to two scarab space, uh, this can also be modified by quantity. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the equation's working, but you can use engineer's orbs to increase the quantity of these by 20% as well. Now 6% doesn't sound like a lot, but as you're mapping and you're kind of getting through the uh, the atlas, you're gonna run into probably about 10 of these, I would say, because of the natural strong boxes, as well as just the extra strong box you're getting. Uh, and if you stop and you roll them uh, with you know some alchemy orbs, and what you're looking for here is additional map items, as well as contains either a additional multiple rusted polished or gilded scarabs you can get a bit of extra bank and you know maybe fund a few of the uniques that your build needs like a diade and dawn or something like that some of the scarabs go for almost uh you know 10c uh, and people are definitely buying individual scarabs right now so i would definitely look into picking up secret operations to get a bit of extra currency under your belt so the other thing I went for here uh, was the Harbinger. So Harbingers, I thought were going to maybe it'll be a little bit difficult for a lot of builds, uh, but for my build specifically, due to the fact I am playing a clearing build, they were just free real estate. As expected, they've dropped me about an exalt to two exalts worth of exalted shards so far. I haven't used the Kirak mod at all. It just really does add up. If you do like 100 maps in a day, that's 100 Harbingers, you're gonna get a you know an exalt or two. Uh, so it's definitely very, very worth it. Uh, and overall, it's been quite lucrative. So I have all of the Harbinger nodes. Uh, this one actually doesn't really make them any harder. Uh, it just makes them kind of move around faster and spawn their minions faster with more of them. So overall, it's pretty much just a complete upside. Uh, and in terms of the actual dropping of full currency orbs, uh, it's not incredibly noticeable, but I have gotten a few extra bindings, kiosk orbs, and alchemy orbs, and it's really helped with my alchemy and binding sustain quite a lot. So I would recommend getting the Harbinger nodes out of necessity, just from the fact that you won't have to buy alchemy orbs uh, due to the you're getting so many shards uh, from the actual harbingers and it's going to be able to infinitely sustain your alchemy orbs basically uh, indefinitely as long as you pick up the shards and it's definitely something I wholeheartedly recommend. Okay, uh, the next one I want to talk here about is Shrine. Uh, so Shrine is actually very, very good in my opinion. Uh, overall, it's been quite a slam dunk. It gives you a ton of extra monsters and it can occasionally give you an acceleration shrine, which is a lot of fun to play with and it's going to increase your mapping speed in that map specifically quite a lot. Um, and overall, it's just a few extra monsters. Nothing to write home about. You could definitely skip this, but if you want the extra monsters and you want the extra sustain, it could be pretty good as well. Uh, it'll just help you progress a little bit faster. 
Okay, one note that I didn't take here are the rare monster duplications. So these, in my opinion, the only reason you would take these if map sustain was going to be an issue, which I thought it might be, uh, and overall it really hasn't been. With the other nodes on the tree, it's been an absolute dream, and with Kirak to kind of supplement the ones which I don't have, it's been quite easy. So I decided not to take these. Uh, you can certainly take them. Uh, also, in addition to that, with the Arc Nemesis League present in every map, uh, there has been an absolutely overwhelming amount of currency uh, and opportunity to do the kiosk recipe and acquire rare jewelry. Uh, so you have needed this node here spoils of war uh, so you can definitely skip out on these ones if you're not interested in them i probably would recommend not going for them okay so what else did i do uh so after i took those nodes here and i was kind of getting into like the red maps uh this is when i decided to pick up essence now quite a few creators were calling essence bait uh they were saying it was probably gonna be pretty bad for currency uh but i decided to pick it up because i just wanted to use it myself uh so i decided to pick it up and i um i just basically got a lot of essences and just started crafting my own gear. So you can see here, um, the first thing, one of the first things I purchased after purchasing my early gear was a six link astral plate uh, using the um, the divination cards, uh, the Celestial Justicar. card. Um, now I just picked this up because I needed some armor because I needed some defense uh, and I wanted to get into it and I decided that I was going to get it and get a six link going for some quality of life. Now I need to craft this thing and I didn't really have any materials and I didn't have any fossils. So I thought, you know, oh, what the hey, let's use those essences that I've been picking up. Now I used probably about 10 essences in total and I was able to get a pretty damn good roll, which I've been pretty happy with and has been doing me pretty damn well. Uh, so I've been able to self craft most of my gear. Um, I think I bought these boots here though, um, but I do believe I've just been throwing essences all over my gear and it's been doing me pretty well and been smoothing out my progression quite nicely. So if you're playing SSF uh, or if you're just kind of not someone who does, doesn't really want to trade much in early game, I definitely recommend taking these essence nodes here uh, as well as the essence nodes up here, Amplified Energies. Those are the ones which I would say are you know pretty damn nice to pick up. And they're going to smear out your progression significantly, giving you a ton of free chaos orbs that you can feel like pretty easy about just throwing at your gear, even if the one stat the essence says isn't the one you really want. Uh, and you can kind of just really gear up pretty quick and pretty effectively. Um, now, okay, moving on. If you want to get absolutely crazy rich right now, uh, what I would recommend is actually doing any tier map. It can be white, yellow, or red uh, with either the new lead mechanic, which is going to be its own video, which you definitely should check out after this. You can find multiple examples right now with the recipe me and my stream discovered um, but uh, the thing that I would recommend if you're not interested in Arc Nemesis or you don't really understand it yet uh, is to do Essence okay so essence overall is going to be very very lucrative right now with a lot of essences like dread at least when i went to sleep uh there were seven c each for shrieking dreads uh wrath sell for about three to four c uh and there's also a few others that also sell quite well uh but most of them sell for about two c for the shrieking and you're going to get a shrieking you know on average probably about two to three to four maybe even up to six of them per map and that is due to amplified energies plus your guaranteed essence as well as the small nodes giving you a chance to get an additional essence on top of your base chance to get an essence uh, but also this node here, Crystal Resonance. So due to the fact that you're upgrading most of your essences to Shrieking, uh, or if you get like a purple essence, you're going to be using the Corrupted um, Remnants on them, uh, Crystal Resonance is basically going to give you two times the amount of essences every single map that you do. And this is essentially a straight up two times. So it's going to make the map quite a little bit harder. It's going to make you have to deal with both the essences at once, which can be quite difficult for some builds. But if you're feeling up to the challenge, you've got a reasonably strong build, uh, it will basically just double your profits. Uh, so, you know, if you, for example, uh, go into a map and you get a purple essence, right? Uh, and you use a corrupted remnant on it to turn into a corrupted essence and maybe you get a delirium upgrade. Awesome. And it still has a shrieking essence present on the essence and you open it up. Uh, it's going to give you two essences of delirium instead of one. Um, so overall, this is essentially just a ridiculous node you're going to be absolutely swimming in a ridiculous amount of essences it's kind of just crazy uh and overall i can recommend it uh with all these essences being 2c and even at worst 1c uh, you're gonna be making quite a little bit of currency selling these on the market or you can take the initiative and craft gear with yourself uh with these essences and sell it to other players as well i can wholeheartedly recommend this due to the fact that the new influence system is completely ridiculous Okay, so if you want to really take your essence um, kind of like farming to the next level, you can also take Crystal Lattice. Uh, this is very noticeable when it actually does proc, especially when you get that with a Shrieking Essence. You basically get a full screen of essences to click um, and pick up. It's completely crazy and a lot of fun. You're going to be making quite a lot of money off that. Okay, um, so those are pretty much the nodes I picked up. I decided then after to go for Expedition as I thought it would be pretty fun and I saw a lot of potential for logbooks, but that's more of an economy side of things. After this, you can 
I mean, you go for whatever you want. I went for Expedition because I saw an opportunity and I'm still very, very happy with that opportunity. Um, but overall, I think that my Atlas tree has worked out quite well for me. Uh, and then lastly here, I've gone for a heist uh, as over here and here. Due to the fact that blueprints are quite expensive right now, there's not available, none, none available on the market. People do still want contracts. It's a hot topic uh, and it does not really have too much impact on my mapping experience because the main thing I want to do right now is Arc Nemesis. Uh, I already have Expedition going on, uh, so I don't want too much of the stuff going on in my maps. Uh, so Heist was a pretty good combo. And then I've also taken the Rogue Metamorph for the same reason. I think that Arc Nemesis is one of the most lucrative leagues they've put out in a very long time. So I'm wanting to take full advantage of that before we see any adjustments um to the league uh so overall that is my atlas passive and that is how progression has gone let's talk a little bit about the character here uh how it's played out and also the new influenced items uh overall so the character has played out quite well now i'm not going to dwell too long on it due to the fact that i did obviously league start this last league but it's fair to say um that it has had no issues with any of the new content and has fully done uh, up to two void stones now i think i'm going to be pretty much fully primed and in a position to do all of my own content myself uh due to the fact that you know there's just currency coming out from every single you know like uh, direction at at you you can do anything you want and get quite rich right now uh so i think that i'm probably going to be able to scale my character to a point in which it can do most of the favorite map system here over here like i could probably do serious myself for example uh and i could probably also do um everything but the fear myself and maybe the maven i'll buy a carry for as well but everything else is probably fair game um so that's gonna be where the character's at uh i didn't really run into any issues i had a pretty slow start due to the fact that i hadn't practiced the acts at all uh so make sure you're a little bit careful about getting your four links in the acts uh, but overall it's been a very smooth experience and i can wholeheartedly recommend the corrupting fever gladiator to anyone who wants a mapping focused build it's quite good at arc nemesis you know it's able to clear them well in t16s and it also has fantastic opportunities with the new influence types as well as uniques um, they've supported very very well and overall there was a little bit of concern around the actual amulet mod being removed. Some people are saying that it's not there. Uh, but from what I understand and people checking in standard, it is still there. They've just renamed it and it's not got uh, mana. It's not used with skills anymore. Uh, it's called like uh, aura, non-aura uh, abilities or something like that. So it is still in the game and you still are able to get it. Uh, and people have assured me it's well and truly not an issue. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this build though. Uh, okay, so you're able to gain access to these new Eldritch Implicits. And I can tell you, oh man, there is some doozies, some absolute bangers available here uh, for this build. A lot of the different Eldritch Implicits are very, very good for a lot of builds, but specifically for Corrupting Fever, it didn't really have many options on boots, uh, uh, chest piece, uh, and you know gloves either really. It had some options, but not a whole lot. Well, it's got all the options now with boots having stuff like movement speed avoid ailments as well as all sorts of other things on them uh, as well as chest having a ton of increased aura effect uh, they also have further increased aura effect so they basically have aura effect on exarch and on eater of worlds uh, and then you can also get defensive you can also go for a few unique mobs like i have right here flask uh flask in the charge every three seconds um, I'm pretty sure that's basically just the Pathfinder Ascendancy. I didn't roll for this specifically. This is kind of just what I ended up with with my own SSF level of Eldritch Currency. So I was trying to roll it. Basically, every Eldritch Currency I got, I just threw at my gear. Uh, but overall, they're quite impressive. They're very, very powerful. And you're going to get some very, very crazy items out of the new um, expansion. They're insane on a massive power level uh, in these four slots uh, with some niche kind of like, you know, circumstances uh, with the exception of like seven link helmets and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure most people are going to want to be rocking Eldritch items due to the fact they're just so powerful in terms of the damage department. And they also, you know, have a lot of mods that the influence pool have, which are just better. Now, further, um, you can start capitalizing on the ability to go for more defensive gear now because you're getting your two damage influence modifiers for free. Uh, well, free. Um, you're able to go for six modifiers on the core drop pool. So if that's boots, you can go, for example, for move speed, life, um you know kiosk res uh, another res and then you can just get like spell suppression on every single one of your core pieces and that's exactly what i plan to do so you're going to be able to get a lot more tanky in this new expansion you can get capped spell suppression on pretty much any character now um due to the fact that you don't have to worry about juggling influence mods as part of your core six uh, so overall i fully expect to see most builds with capped spell suppression due to this change uh, and as such you're probably going to want to be rolling on evasion or uh, evasion hybrid bases unlike i've done here 
So overall, very, very strong indeed. Um, quite powerful. And the new Eldritch modifiers are definitely nothing to sneeze at. All right, let's move on. Uh, this is getting quite long. Uh, finally, I am using a Ashes of Star Onyx Amulet here, which is quite a nice one. Uh, this one's basically just for the Wanda version, but it's going to give you a ton of mana reservation efficiency, which is really good for the build early on. It's going to allow you to run Determination and tank up with the wands, uh, and also it's got plus one level of skill gems. Plus two is probably going to be an end game thing. They're very difficult to acquire, so I wouldn't look to try and get that very early. Ashes of Star is a great substitute for the build. You can slap Charisma on it, and it's probably a pretty damn good substitute. And until you get a really, really end game item uh, and go for bows if you're planning on doing that. Uh, overall, that is basically the gear. Um, everything else is exactly as it was last league and I've had no issues with any content and I fully expect to keep blasting. So that's the video, guys. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. I don't think I've missed anything in particular. Arc Nemesis is going to be its own video coming up after this one. Make sure you check it out if you want to make absolutely crazy amounts of currency with what we discovered. And until next time, cheers.